Okay, so by and large, there were a lot of other experiments in there, but simply put, we showed the not too dependent recognition depends on the presence of this enzyme. We did it in the lab in cells, but we also shot bacteria into animals and we found the same thing. And we found that this n glycolyl MDP is a much more potent immune stimulator molecule than the N acetyl, which is found in other organisms. And that work was published last summer. So, you were going to say, well, if NOT2 is really so important for mycobacteria, why do I think of NOT2 as a Crohn's gene? Why have I never thought of NOT2 as involved in tuberculosis or leprosy or these other diseases? Is there any evidence when you go out to Vietnam or Nepal or somewhere else around the world that NOT2 has anything to do with established mycobacterial diseases? Because if not, then you'd say this is a bit of a strange theory. Well, it turns out that one group in the U.S. found an association between NOD2 mutations and tuberculosis in a study of African Americans. And last December, a group from China and Singapore did a genome-wide association study of leprosy. So you've heard of these genome studies of Crohn's disease, where you just ask of all the 25,000 genes in the human genome, which genes are associated with Crohn's disease, and they come up with you know, these lists of genes. They did the same thing for thousands of people with leprosy in China. And you will see they found six genes that are associated with leprosy in China. And one of them is NOD2. So in fact, when you think of the different Crohn's genes, the established tuberculosis genes, and the established leprosy genes, this is what the Venn diagram looks like. We know that Crohn-specific genes include, as I mentioned, ATG16L1 and IRGEM and NOD2. But if we look at tuberculosis, we know there's a susceptibility to TB if you have mutations in your vitamin D receptor. We know that NREMP, which is a, a classic TB gene, is involved in TB and leprosy. And then you put it all together, you'll see here that NOD2 is the only gene so far that's established to be important for Crohn's disease and tuberculosis and leprosy in human populations. So I'm not talking about mice here where you, you stress them with different things. I'm talking about real genetic studies of real people who have the common human diseases. So I believe at this point the immune deficiency model not only is, has more supporting data than autoimmunity they, model, but also that the immune deficiency model is compatible with a mycobacterial infection. It doesn't prove a mycobacterial infection, I'm just saying it's not, con it's not contradictory. It fits with it, and therefore you need to now do more work, okay? So let's imagine that the people who have NOD2 mutations and IRGM mutations and ATG16L1 mutations are a subset of Crohn's patients, and then there's the other people who have different mutations. I don't know what's wrong with them. Let's just focus on this subset and say that that subset of people may have a problem handling mycobacteria. If that's the case, why would they get an intestinal disease? And why would they, in which mycobacteria might or might not be involved? So mycobacteria may be impaired tuberculosis represents an attractive candidate for such a process because it already is known to cause IBD in cattle. Any of you who's a farmer knows that the number one reason you keep a cow on the farm is to produce more milk in money than to consume food to keep the animal. So this disease doesn't manifest like human disease. Cows don't come to you and say, I have pain and diarrhea. Cows show up as not making milk. And you don't keep milk cows around that are of low productivity. Eventually, if you leave them long enough, they have weight loss and diarrhea. And this is not an association between MAP and, and this disease, it's a cause, because we know that if you put the bacteria into the cow, three to five years later you can get the disease, and you take the bacteria out of that cow and you can put it into another animal and you get disease. So this is causality, this is established. Okay, so what would you like to know about whether this organism causes Crohn's disease? Well, it turns out there's really not a lot of research in this animal because it's an economic disease, and if your cow is sick and not producing, it's easier to just kill the animal than to do research, come up with new diagnostic tests and stuff like that. So there's not a lot of fundamental research on it, and especially in a disease that takes three to five years to study, if you can get a grant from the CIHR for three years, you're very happy. You're not going to get any data in a disease like this. So what I did with a colleague in New Zealand 
is we contacted people around the world and said, let's at least for a start, for the first time, have a standard reference book for this organism because there were so many disparate views out there and all kinds of people saying all kinds of things about this organism that we didn't even have a baseline of common understanding. So I highly recommend this fascinating book that has recently appeared from Cabby Publishers. Um, I, I have to get my agent here to promote it. I should actually have a little stall over there. Uh, does this book tell you the cause of Crohn's disease? No, it does not. Uh, is this a bestseller? No, not yet. But if everybody in here buys it for themselves and for everyone in their family, one day my publisher will be happy that this book exists. Until then, it just gives us some minimal understanding about this organism, but it's really a long list of questions rather than a long list of answers, unfortunately. So, what do we know at this point about the, this organism that I uh, abbreviate as MAP and Crohn's disease? We know that the DNA from this organism has been detected in Crohn's biopsies. Um, and there seems to be a, a strong association, but the results do vary from lab to lab. So that uh, there still is some issue about getting a single system to look for it and finding that different labs in different countries with different studies have consistent results. Um, has this seen, been seen by microscopy? Yes, uh, but only by one lab that has looked at it, which is our lab. Um, so it would be valuable to find out if that's a reproducible observation in science. Nothing really counts when it's been done once. It has to be done at least twice, if not three times, before you start to believe it. And in a study from uh, Oslo of Norway last year, uh, Ingrid Olsen took biopsies from Crohn's patients and isolated the lymphocytes, the immune cells, and asked those cells, what gets you excited? What do you respond to? What are the kinds of bacteria that make you angry? And she threw E. coli on them, they said, nah, it doesn't bother me. She threw mycobacteria on them and said, yeah, yeah, I get excited. So there seems to be an immune response to mycobacteria in those lymphocytes. And she was able to show, to some extent, certain antigens, certain specific proteins of mycobacteria that are recognized by these lymphocytes. So does that explain it all? Um, no, because presence does not equal cause. Right? You all know that if a crime is committed in this hotel today, that does not make you all guilty of that crime. It just meant you could have been a witness to that crime, or you may have been unaware that something was happening in the next room over. So beyond saying, ah, we see the presence of something, you have to say, well, how could this thing result in the outcome that we're trying to understand, okay? And that's where things get even more difficult. So. What I've been doing to answer this question is making things up. Because if I can't get data, I can at least sort of sit down uh, with PowerPoint or pen and paper and come up with models and think it through and ask myself which things are worth studying or not. So this is where the lecture goes from me talking to you to me asking you a question. When I think of a classic cause of gastroenteritis like Shigella, Clostridium difficile, these acute events where you were well, you go to a picnic, you have bad food, and two days later you have the runs. I think that these are what I consider outside-in diseases. So at the top here, you have your, your tube where you have your bacteria that are floating down from your mouth towards your rectum that way. And you have this barrier, and I'm sure you've seen talks in Crohn's disease about how epithelial barrier may or may not be very important. And this is where, of course, the, uh, the treatments are supposed to work by looking for mucosal healing, right? So in an outside-in disease, one of the first events is bacteria invade through that mucosa and cause damage. And the ulceration and the damage of the mucosa is a primary event, and as a result, you have a leaky gut. And because you have a leaky gut, you have activation of inflammation, which causes pathology that's deeper. You have reactive lymph nodes. And you may even have manifestations outside of the gut. A classic example is if this bacteria was E. coli 157 and you were living in Walkerton, you would have a colitis here, you'd have damage, and then you may end up on dialysis from kidney disease. Right? That's how I see acute bacterial gastroenteritis. 